Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have a great episode, episode 91, and it's hard to believe that I have 91 episodes uh, that have been released. Uh, the feedback from you guys, the listeners, have been has been unbelievable. Um, the emails that I get every day, uh, the thank yous and uh, the questions and the comments and all of the great positive feedback that I get uh, is amazing. I want to thank you for that. Uh, if you'd like to send me a message, you can email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I want to thank GoHunt.com Insider for being the title sponsor of this podcast. If you haven't signed up for the Go Hunt Insider yet, uh, you need to. You can go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider, click on the blue join now button, and when you join, GoHunt.com will send you a $50 Kuyu gift card. And GoHunt.com uh, is just launching their uh, filtering 2.0, uh, which is uh, unbelievable harvest statistics across the West for all species. And uh, soon to be in the next couple of weeks, uh, the, the most uh, uh, advanced draw system, draw odds uh, calculator uh, that there is. So. Um, go check them out. I also want to thank DeadeyeOutfitters.com. Uh, they make quality t-shirts and hats and hoodies. Uh, they are hunters. They make products with hunters in mind for hunters. Um, and the response from the J. Scott Outdoors podcast listeners has been great. According to Deadeye Outfitters, uh, I see a lot of people uh, wearing their gear. And I just want to thank Deadeye Outfitters for their support. And uh, I just uh, want to thank you guys, the listeners. Uh, today is Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there. Hopefully you're enjoying uh, great times with your family. And uh, we have so much to be thankful for. And uh, just enjoy this holiday. And it's, it's a great holiday to spend with family and friends. Uh, guys, we've got some great hunts here coming up. Uh, Arizona elk season starts tomorrow. The late elk season, I've got a lot of friends that are out hunting and chasing those bulls. Uh, remember on those late hunts to be focusing on kind of the thicker, deeper, darker, nastier areas where those bulls, uh, they don't move a whole lot this time of year. Um, get on those north, northeast faces where it's thick and dark uh, and you'll have better success. The sheep hunts, uh, both desert and rocky uh, here in Arizona or right around the corner. I know Dar, Dar's been scouting for his Rocky hunt and uh, he's got a client and I've been scouting hard for the desert sheep hunt uh, in unit 22. Uh, yesterday was a little bit bittersweet for me. Uh, the ram that uh, I've been watching that Dar and I had nicknamed uh, last year, we had nicknamed him Gnarly while we were scouting for the auction uh, desert sheep tag. Uh, was harvested by this year's uh, auction hunter. Uh, I was hoping that my client uh, was going to be able to harvest him here in a few days. And we've been watching that ram and trying to keep tabs on that ram. And uh, anyway, to make a long story short, the uh, Arizona auction tag holder for Desert Sheep harvested that ram uh, yesterday with, uh, with a bow. And um, it's a phenomenal ram and he's got all kinds of character and um, you can go on my Instagram page and see some photos and video of that ram and uh, paying honor to that ram as a warrior. He was uh, 10 years old and that was the main reason why he was kind of high. Well, he was the highest ram on my uh, quote unquote hit list. Uh, my hunter wants to harvest a, a mature ram and that's the oldest ram that I know of in the unit. And um, it's... Uh, it's bittersweet, but I'm happy for the state of Arizona. Uh, that money that is provided uh, on that auction tag, uh, it allows uh, the Game and Fish and the Arizona Desert Bighorn Sheep Society to do many, many things for the betterment of, of uh, those animals. And uh, so it's bittersweet, but happy for the state of Arizona and, and the great ram that was harvested. Uh, guys, I want to encourage you on these upcoming hunts to give it 110% and you never know when it's your last hunt and uh, you just want to go out there and give it your all and enjoy it with your family and friends and um, I just want to thank you guys again for listening and let's get right to this episode. Uh, Dar Colburn uh, 
invited me to go on the hunt with his son Parker in 13B and we had an unbelievable experience up there with Breck Bundy and his crew. Uh, Breck harvested a unreal buck that uh, grosses I, I believe over 290 inches. It's going to be one of the largest bucks ever killed off the Arizona Strip and then Parker was able to capitalize on quote unquote a strip buck. He kept wanting a, a buck that he, he called a strip buck that was lots of mass, lots of character, cheaters, etc. and he did that. Um, so let's get right to the episode uh, with uh, Dark Holborn. I also want to remind you that you can follow along our adventures on Instagram at J. Scott Outdoors, my associate Dark Holborn at Dar Colburn, that's D-A-R-R Colburn. Uh, our website, jscottoutdoors.com, our YouTube channel, J. Scott Outdoors, and our Facebook page. I appreciate all the support. Let's get right to the episode. One more thing, guys, before we get to the episode, I'm a bit of a scatterbrain. I just wanted to remind you, when you go to deadeyeoutfitters.com, use the J. Scott promo code and you'll receive a 10% discount, as well as when you go to gohunt.com uh, insider and sign up for the insider, if you use the J. Scott promo code, uh, you will receive the $50 Kuyu gift card. Let's get right to the episode. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got a special episode with my hunting partner, Dar Colburn. And uh, Dar's oldest son, Parker, uh, 13 years old, uh, drew the Arizona Strip Unit 13B. And we went up and had a phenomenal hunt uh, with uh, Breck Bundy and Brett Simonson of MDA Outfitters. Uh, Dar, it's going to be great to, uh, we had a great episode talking about Paul's incredible 121 inch coos deer and then to follow it up with this buck and this hunt, uh, it's pretty special. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely a dream season for me so far with my boys this year. It's been, been incredible. Great experience. Yeah. Dar, what does it mean to you to have your boys uh, enjoy uh, hunting like you do? What does that mean to you? Uh, I'm just I'm just grateful that they're they're into it and and are following in you know in my footsteps. Um, they're each really different personalities, but they they both enjoy it, and uh, it's been it's been neat watching them watching them grow and and teaching them. Um, you know, Paul, this was his first first big game hunt this year um so you know teaching him all the ins and outs and then parker you know he's 13 almost 14 so he's had three seasons of hunting under his belt and he's really developed into a pretty good hand when it comes to hunting and glassing so it's just it's fun watching him develop and trying to teach him right you know you know as an outsider um watching how you have developed those boys it's interesting and you mentioned they both have their own personalities and their own styles like we all do and it's it's been fun to watch how you kind of let them develop on their own and you know prod them when they need prodding but also let them lay when when you know the t the time is right uh to you know, let them develop their own style and their own, you know, pace and, and some of their own uh, characteristics. And I think that's very important. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, definitely fun. They're each different and, and unique, and uh, that's what makes it special, you know, spending time with each of them. It's, uh, it's just it's a lot of fun for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I know before the draw, um, you had a, a situation where your wife had max points I believe she was one of seven people with max points for deer and I know you and I had many conversations uh, about uh, this very situation and I, I want to say a couple years ago we even had the conversation and you were pretty clear that you wanted Parker to have a little bit of experience under his belt before he was faced with the, the pressures uh, quote unquote um, of the strip and I, I think you made a great decision tell me what a little bit what made you make that decision and how that all unfolded well my wife had been applying for you know almost 20 years she had uh, max points last year which going into the draw which was 18 so that, I think there was one of I think there was nine residents left with max um, last year going in and I know one did not put in so 
I knew we st- stood a pretty good chance of pretty much being guaranteed uh, 13B, you know, Arizona strip tag. So I, I debated heavily on, you know, if I should put in knowing that she would send the tag over to Parker. Uh, you know, him being 13, I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to focus on the experience more than a grind out hunt, you know, that was going to be tough situation, low deer density, that sort of thing. But in the end, I felt this year was a phenomenal moisture year, and everyone was saying, you know, they thought the strip was going to be fantastic this year. And so I, I kind of decided, you know, Parker has shot, pretty much shot a buck and several animals every year since he's 10, and he's now, you know, he's got a little bit more experience. He's almost 14. So I figured with, with that and the, the really good antler growth year, um, and him being in eighth grade, which is, is a little easier to miss time away from school when you're, you know, in grade school versus getting into high school. I just figured with all those factors, um, this was kind of the perfect storm. It was the, the time to, to cash in and, uh, and see how, how it would, how it would go. Yeah. And, and, um, I know you, I mean, you went back and forth and I think one of the big things with that, like you said, was the fact that he's in eighth grade and once he gets into high school, um, you know, missing a week of school is, is going to put you way more behind, uh, than if, you know, you miss a week of, of school in eight, in eighth grade. And so I think all, everything lined up perfectly there to, and you made a good decision. And obviously, uh, the outcome was, was phenomenal. Um, when you, uh, drew the tag when Parker got, Odette got the tag and then gave it to Parker. Um, I, I want to ask you about, uh, Breck Bundy and MDA Outfitters. And, uh, we knew that Breck had a tag himself also. And what was, well, I'd like you to explain to the listeners a thought process behind choosing Breck and even though he had his own tag for the unit? Well, I talked to Breck um, just before, you know, the draw. Um, like I said, knowing that uh, that my wife was going to draw, that she was pretty much guaranteed. I, I wanted to have everything lined up prior to the, the draw results coming out so that, you know, I wasn't in a rat race trying to find someone, you know, and, and get them booked and, uh, you know, feel feel that pressure so I kind of I talked to Breck and I we've had six or seven of our good friends have hunted with Breck before and all shot great bucks and had a you know great experiences with him up there so after talking with him I mean it was kind of a no-brainer I just felt that that uh he was the right guy for the job and so I actually sent him a deposit uh I believe prior to the results coming out, and then confirmed uh, when I got the credit card charge that uh, I called him that night that they charged the cards and told him, you know, that we had we had got a hit, and that's when he informed me that that he also had got a charge, and he also had had max points going in, but I believe there was about 140 non-residents with max deer points, so you know he beat the odds as well this year, um, so he. He told me on the phone that night, you know, I'd still love to hunt with you. You can hunt with uh, one of his guides, Brett Simonson. And, you know, if, if we wanted to do that, we could share a camp and just have a great time. Um, but no pressure. He just said to call him back and let him know in the next day or so. So, you know, after debating on it for overnight and talking to, my, you know, my friend, you... Brian Rimsa, Daniel Franco, you know, people that have hunted with him, we all came to the conclusion that, uh, you know, Breck was going to be pounding it hard for his his tag, and it would just be a, a fun camp and a, a good time, so I ultimately decided to, to use him. Yeah, and I think that was a great decision. Obviously, Breck uh, put a lot of time scouting, ran a bunch of trail, trail cameras, obviously shot an unbelievable buck uh, himself, and I think, you know, it... it Anytime the guide has a tag himself, it, it's easy to think, well, you know, are, are we going to get good time and, 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 you know, get a good camp and what have you. And I think uh, he ex- exceeded our expectations. Uh, 
So, Dar, throughout the summer, um, Breck was sending you uh, trail camera photos of bucks um, from his scouting and such. And what would you say your impression of the deer were? Uh, and did you notice anything about trail camera pictures that you learned? I definitely noticed that it's an unreal place up there. And the, the pictures he was sending me are, I mean, they're really, they're not even real, the deer up there. It's so so far out of normal um, how big they are. But, but then again, you also look at the pictures, and I don't think the trail cameras do these bucks justice just because of you don't get a feel for their body size. Um, you know, we shot deer, mule deer here in Arizona and Colorado, and they, they, the body size does not compare to these deer on the strip. They're gigantic. And I think, uh, I think these trail cameras make the, make the bucks look smaller, quite frankly. So yeah, the I mean, he uh, would send, I would be like, eh, you know, we can do better. And, and he's telling me, no, this is a big deer, you know, and I'm sitting here, you know, critiquing it when I don't have the, you know, the experience he does as to, you know, the body size. Yeah, I mean, you and I both would go over some of the photos and, you know, there were deer that just didn't really impress us uh, from the different angles on the trail camera. But, you know, it, it it's just a great lesson to learn that you have to know the body size, whatever animal you're hunting, because body size can throw off the way the antlers look and make an antler either look big or it can look small. I mean, I've seen small bodied animals make their horns or their antlers, uh, depending if you're talking bighorn sheep or if you're talking deer or elk, um, you know, make the antlers look big. Um, and, and in this case, uh, there were several deer that, you know, Breck's like, you know, this buck, uh, you could probably go after and probably not have a lot of people around you. And you and I, you know, it looked like a, you know, like a 170 type of buck with maybe, you know, 20, 20 inches of extra, 25 inches of extra. In reality, it was probably a, you know, 185 frame deer with 25 inches of extra. And, um, you know, there was that one buck that had the big, heavy, gnarly bases and nice four by four that we thought would maybe go 200 and shooting went 230 or something like that. Yeah. And I, I think that's where you get, you know, Brett's experience, you know, to say yes, this is a big buck. We need to hunt it. Um, it's. I, I just think the trail cams a lot of times. I would say the majority of the time make them look smaller. And and I would say that with the majority of animals I've seen. You know. Yeah, they, I they, agree. They just, they definitely make it, make the animal look smaller than it is. So that's a, you know. Dar, one of my impressions. Uh, I was up there on 13B a couple years ago with our friend Daniel Franco, and he had hired Breck Bundy and. Um, Daniel harvested a beautiful, typical buck uh, to right towards the end of the season. And, um, you know, one of the things that struck me about Breck and his crew is the quality of character. And I, I think spending the time then on this hunt, Parker's hunt in 13B, um, here you've got an unbelievably huge place. Uh, you've got big deer roaming around and you know, there's a lot of great guides up on the Arizona Strip. One of the things that I really liked about uh, Breck and Brett, uh, one of his main guides, and his whole crew, uh, you know, from his dad's down to his brother's down to, you know, all of his different friends, is real high-quality character individuals. I mean, there were cer certain situations where, you know, we could have, quote unquote, stepped on other people and, you know, charged right in there on top of somebody. And, and they just chose not to do that. They chose to, uh, you know, it, it just seemed like they always took the high road. And I really admired that. I saw certain situations where maybe even I would have been a little more aggressive. And it's just, I think, hats off to them to uh, the quality of character that they have. No, definitely. They're, they're, great individuals, great character people, and, and that's one of the things that was definitely important to me. Um, bring my son up there, you know, I wanted him to have a good experience first and foremost, and, you know, you want those things 
passed on and to be an example for, for someone, the younger generation that's coming up hunting. And uh, so that was definitely important and, and very much appreciated having, you know, having those values in camp for sure. As the hunt was coming, um, it, how, how was your prep? And, and uh, I know you spent a lot of time trying to get organized. Uh, we ended up taking outfitter tents. And um, tell me about some of your preparation and, and trying to organize for the trip and maybe what you would recommend to people that are going up there uh, whenever they draw the tag. Well, we definitely did a lot of uh prep uh Dan Bright, our good friend Dan Bright and I went up ended up going up on Monday before the hunt. And so we each had a a trailer full of gear, a uh, couple outfitter tents. Uh Dan had a stove for his tent. I had a uh uh just a two burner stove and a, a big buddy heater for for the tent to keep it warm. Um so we got up there, you know, Monday and got camp set up, and which is a, a chore in itself. You know, you're 30 to 50 miles, 60 miles on a dirt road just to get to your camp, sometimes even farther in that unit. And there's no running running back for gas or to the grocery store or anything like that. So um, one thing we did that I, I thought worked very well is uh, plan for meals for each night when how many people were going to be there. And I took up a little freezer. Um, and had all the meals frozen in, in, in Ziploc bags for that night. That way uh, we could thaw it out a couple days in advance um, and really only had to run the freezer just uh, an hour, probably a day, just to keep everything thing frozen. So that uh, that was huge in, in my, my opinion. Yeah, I definitely think, you know, one of the biggest challenges is when you have a big group like that and people coming and going is, uh, trying to organize and have enough food for everybody and try and plan for lunches and and uh, what have you. And I think you did a great job. Uh, another thing I think it's important is people realize that, you know, have spare tires, uh, have, you know, lots of extra gas uh, for the jet, not only for the vehicles, but for the generators. Um, you know, one piece of equipment that uh, Breck and, and Brett uh, had that I thought was unreal were those uh, Polaris razors. Uh, they had the four-seater razors, which you and I both have Polaris Rangers. Um, and tell me about those uh, razors, Dar. Yeah, they're they're amazing. Uh, Breck actually left his for Dan and I to use the first couple days um, we were up there. And so we got to really drive around in it and uh, get a feel for them. And they are probably the best riding vehicle I've ever been in um, on those, you know, dirt roads, off-road wise. So they're they're just amazing. They make it comfortable. The, the downside is, you know, they don't have the big bed like the Polaris Ranger does. So you're a little bit a little bit tight on gear if you got, you know, three guys in that thing that plus all the gear and the gun and everything else. It's, it does get a little tight, but in terms of a, a ride on on those rough roads, they're they're amazing. That's for sure. Um, and in, yeah, I mean you can cover twice the country. Uh, you know, it, it, in the same amount of time, you could cover twice as much country. Yeah, definitely. And um, in terms of gear that we brought too, I, I definitely think you know we brought. I want to say we brought uh, about 50 gallons of gas on my trailer, and Dan Bright had another 40 or 50 gallons. And then Brett and Breck also had quite a bit of gas as well, but we definitely did did have and used quite a bit of gas. So that's you definitely need gas up there. Yeah, for sure. What were your impressions of the strip uh, going up there for the first time? You know, you hear before you go up that it's big. You hear that it's thick. Uh, you hear that you know it's glassable in areas. You hear that. Uh, you know, there's people everywhere. You hear that, you know, as big as it is that, you know, it'd be surprising how many people you see. Um, and then once you got up there, what was your impression of, of the whole area? Uh, well, driving in, you know, we had a hour and a half, you know, two hour drive kind of through the unit. Um, so I got to look at a bunch of the different, different country 
to get a feel for it. And, you know, there's there's a little bit of everything from, from deserts to, to pines to open stuff to thick, thick juniper country, um, big canyons, you know, flats. There's just, there's all kinds of country there. Um, you know, we, we didn't see too many people until a day or two before the season started, and then it, it definitely seemed like a lot of people people rolled in up there. Um, I think Brett and Brett did a great job of, of picking picking where we were going to hunt based on um, the help we had in camp and, you know, the hunter situation. Um, you know, we hunted some country that I thought was, was glassable and very huntable, like country that you and I like to hunt versus, you know, hunting areas that uh, you might only see a deer or two and, you know, thick areas that you, are harder to glass. Um, I thought we hunted some more open stuff that we could use our eyes and, and spread out and, uh, you know, glass effectively like we like to do. Yeah, absolutely. Dar, let's take a quick break here, at, uh, hear from our sponsors, and I'll get right back to you. Guys, GoHunt.com Insider is the title sponsor of this podcast. Get everything you need in one spot. Join Insider today. Find and plan your hunts more effectively than ever. Complete state coverage. See detailed information for every unit, every species, every hunt. Interactive maps. Quickly find hunts that meet your exact search criteria and explore them easily. Strategy articles, learn new things, and find hidden opportunities with exclusive articles. Species breakdowns, top trophy units are hiding in plain sight. Find them with our statistics and historical data. Another great thing about GoHunt.com Insider is they have monthly giveaways that are worth 100000 plus a year. Each month you will automatically be entered to win gear, tags, and hunts. That is if you're an Insider member. Past prizes include a $22,000 doll sheep hunt, uh, three Red Rock Precision Rifles with the $21,000 value, uh, five Zeiss Conquest HD binoculars with a $7,500 value. Not to mention this past July they gave away four hunts, an antelope hunt, two elk hunts, and a mule deer hunt. Join Insider today and get a $50 Kuyu gift card. All you have to do is go to gohunt.com forward slash insider, click on the blue join now button, use the promo code jscott at checkout, and gohunt.com will send you a $50 Kuyu gift card. I want to thank gohunt.com insider for being the title sponsor of this podcast. You know, I think one of the things that we were blessed with uh, in talking to Breck and Brad is the fact that this year it seemed like with the weather and all the conditions, the deer were rutting. I mean, uh, every day our group would report uh, rutting, you know, every day. Parker killed on the fourth fourth day, but, um, you know, I was surprised to see as much rutting activity as, as we saw. Yeah, definitely, and we had... You know, it, it got cold and windy Wednesday before the hunt, and it actually snowed um, a pretty decent amount on Wednesday, which, you know, getting that cold front coming through and moisture on the ground, I definitely think that helped, uh, helped with deer movement and, you know, rut, pre-rut activity. You know, I definitely think that helped. Yeah, and I mean, uh, the other cool thing about the timing of that hunt was it was a dark moon, and you know, I think that just helped with overall activity. Uh, I'm sure the guys that are hunting in 13A uh, after the 13B hunt, I'm sure they're going to report a lot of rutting activity up there. I know that they had quite a bit of snow in A, and um, not necessarily, snow doesn't necessarily make the rut, but I definitely think the colder temperatures, um, you know, I was up there with Daniel Franco a couple of years ago, and it was warm. And yeah. it just seemed like the deer weren't moving around near as much. And, you know, I think we see that with coos deer as well. Um, you know, it seems like the colder the temperatures, uh, you know, the more activity, the more those deer are on their feet. And I think that's important when you're dealing with low density, low number areas, uh, having them on their feet as long as possible is huge. Yeah, definitely. And to get back to your question about, you know, my impression when I initially got up there, I think Dan and I, you know, we, we were up there Monday evening, 
Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, prior to the hunt. And I think it was the probably the third day before I actually glassed up a buck. Um, you know, saw a buck actually glassing. So, I, and I think I ended up seeing seven bucks in the first five days I was there. Uh, so that, I mean, it's not a, it's, we had a great hunt, but it is definitely not a high, high deer density place. I mean, it's low, low deer numbers. Yeah. And, and they seem to be pockety too. And, you know, I, I'm somewhat of a fish out of water up there. I don't know if you felt the same way. Um, it felt like every day that went on started to gain some confidence and some momentum and, you know, figuring out where those deer are and where they like to hang. And, being primarily, you know, a coos deer hunter, and it, it's just a little bit different type of a hunt, um, you know, and I think you glass differently, I think, but I think it's important to note that, yeah, I mean, you're not seeing tons and tons of deer where sometimes, you know, we hunt in Colorado and we'll see, you know, 30 bucks in a day and see, you know, 100 deer. Right. Um, you know, so... So you and Dan were already up there, and the plan was for me to pick Parker up on Thursday morning uh, before the hunt, and my nephew Jay uh, Pyburn and I picked up Parker, and um, uh, he was all ready to go. I think we picked him up at 530, and he was basically waiting outside for us, and um, we had a great uh, drive up there, and we drove through Las Vegas, and He'd never seen the strip and got to see the, um, you know, the big casinos from the highway. And, um, uh, you know, traveling with my nephew is always, uh, always uh, fun. And him and Parker had a, had a good time and there were quite a few laughs. Um, and I know we pulled into camp and you and Dan had already looked like you had the five day uh, strip haggard look going. You, you uh, definitely looked seasoned up there when we pulled into camp. Yeah, it definitely, uh, you know, you think you're going to have all this time to get everything set, but it just the days are short and there's a lot to do, you know, getting the camp set up. And it definitely, uh, we were definitely running ragged by the time you guys got there. Yeah. You know, um, in the three days, uh, the first three days, Parker basically, uh, the first morning there was a buck that was just over 200 that, that uh, we were working up the ridge to, to take a look at. Uh, Brian Rimza had been watching that buck for an hour and a half, and uh, Brett had actually bedded him the night before. And, and um, you know, Brian thought he was a 205, you know, type of deer. And um, we heard the gunshot, and another hunter had uh, captured that buck. And, and um, but it just seemed like once the hunt started, uh, my impression was Parker was into the bucks. Uh, basically, every day had a chance at, you know, 195 plus deer every day. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, just to, you know, show the selfish, selfishness of of Breck. You know, we were hunting where where he ended up killing his his big buck. We were hunting there first morning i mean with parker so you know he could have just gone and hunted that buck himself but he didn't uh, and so I'm, we're so happy that that he got that buck because he no one deserves it more than he does that's for sure but yeah did, and go ahead go, no go ahead dar i was just gonna say we did have you know it seemed like every day we had uh opportunities you know either someone in our group had, had spotted a good deer and we were we were on good deer pretty much every day, and it seemed to be getting just getting better every day, rutting wise. Yeah, for sure. And um, you know, I, I think you make a great point about uh, the strategy the night before the hunt. You know, Breck was like, you know, we're going to hunt this big buck, and you know, I want you guys right there with me. And and you know, it wasn't like I'm going to hunt the big buck. It was like let let's go hunt that big buck and. You know, I, I I believe that if if the buck would have been right out in front of you, I, I would have guarantee you that Breck would have probably said Parker shoot that buck, and there probably would have been a great argument where you would have probably said no, Breck, you shoot that buck. And you know, I I just think the world of Breck Bundy uh, and Brett 
I, I think they did a phenomenal job. Uh, there was no, you know, hush, hush, this is our buck, don't tell them about it. I mean, everything was an open book. And, you know, I think they executed a plan perfectly. And I think, um, you know, uh, when when Breck's buck was spotted, I think, you know, it, I, you know, it couldn't happen to a, a, a better guy, a nicer guy. And I'm so happy that he was able to harvest a buck of that size. I mean, I, I want to say they're saying it's 290 inches gross. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's just a phenomenal deer. Um, you know, one of the largest to ever come off the Arizona Strip. Yeah, and it was just, it was special to be, be able to share a camp with, you know, and have a buck like that killed in, in, in the camp you're in. I mean, that's, you know, regardless of the buck Parker shot, uh, just to be in a camp and see a buck like that was, was an amazing, you know, time and story in itself. You know what I mean? So it just added to the whole, whole experience. For sure. And we had a great camp. Um, uh, we had, like you said, and you, you correct me if I miss somebody, but we had Danny Bright, we had you and Parker, me and Jay Pyburn, we had Daniel Franco and Spencer Porter, we had uh, Brian Rimza and Daniel Willett, um, we had uh, a bunch of Breck's uh, crew, and, and uh, we had Brecken and Breck's dad and Brett and um, a bunch of great guys um, in yeah, our Bron- camp. Yeah, Bronson even made it out for a day. Even though his yeah, wife just had a baby. Yeah, he had just had a baby, I think, on Wednesday. Yeah. Um, but it was just a great group of guys, uh, great camaraderie around dinner time, and and um, you know, Danny Bright uh, was the rock, I think, of our camp, and you know, yeah. all the logistics. You know, he really helped you out in in the planning and and getting everything uh, situated and you know, organized. And it was nice to have a group of guys, uh, you know, go wherever, wherever they needed to go. Meaning, you know, if Breck said, go check over here, go check over there. It wasn't like, well, man, that's a long ways away. Or, you know, it was pretty selfless, uh, group that just, uh, you know, was willing to do whatever it took to help the group, uh, you know, Parker and Breck get the best bucks they could. Yeah, definitely. And, and it, definitely guys that you can count on you know if if, you know if you send them somewhere they're going to glass all day they're going to glass hard and if they say there's a big buck or they saw a big buck you know you know they they did see a big one you're not going to waste waste time on on something that you know you probably wouldn't shoot so that was you know reliable help was definitely a huge factor and i think the the camaraderie and the the laughing and the friendship that we had definitely uh you know, made made the hunt no pressure to me. I mean, you know, I put in for a long time to get that tag for my for my wife or, or my son. And you know, sometimes you, you you put a lot of pressure on yourself. But I can honestly say I never one time felt pressure on that hunt. I think it was just because of the friends that were there and we were having such a good time and you know, focusing on just the experience. Of being up there, I, I just think it was it was really an amazing time. You know, on the second day, um, there was a really cool buck that had uh, double cheaters, uh, hook cheaters on both sides, and he was a nice looking buck. Um, I know you and Parker and Brett were kind of up above him or level with him and had him at like 200 yards, I want to say, and you can fill me in on the details and. Uh, Breck and I were down below and it was nice that, uh, uh, Danny and Brian and, uh, uh, Jay and, and, you know, it seemed like everybody got a chance to look at the deer, um, and tell me how hard it was on, you know, a 195 type of buck to, at, at 200 yards or less, uh, bedded, um, how hard was it for, for, for Parker not to shoot that buck? Uh, it was definitely hard. We, you know, we, we, like you said, we got up there. Um, I'd seen the buck going up the bottom, and we had actually seen the buck, Danny and I had seen the buck uh, a couple, three days before the season. And I know Breck's dad, Roger, had seen the buck. Brett had seen the buck. But no one had really got a really good look to see exactly what he is, just that he had 
uh, a hook cheater basically coming off both sides. And so when we found the buck, I think, was that the second morning? Yeah. Yeah, second morning. We got over on it, and we were, I think we had him at 170 yards. He was bedded. I had Parker set up on the bipod in the backpack, I mean, laying down, solid rest. Um, you know, Buck was dead to rights for sure. Um, and we just kept looking at him and kept looking at him. And character factor, he, you know, he, he had the character. He had the hook cheaters on each side, which was really cool. Um, but his back forks were a little weak. And, you know, we just had to make a tough decision. Um, I think being the second day and seeing the buck that, that Brett killed the first night and then, you know, we were on a 200-plus-inch deer the second morning. Um, or the, Actually, that was the first morning. So I just, I kind of felt that you know, man, we we have we have a lot of people up here helping. Um, we've been seeing good deer. Um, you know, we're gonna have good help for the first you know five days of the hunt. But I just you know I felt like we could probably do a little little bit better. But at the same time, you know, it weighed heavy on me this year. Here I've got a 13 year old kid who's you know I know would be stoked with this deer. We've got it bedded at 170 yards in a controlled, you know, controlled situation where he's got a good rest and everything. I mean, I, I in my heart, felt like if we shot this buck on the last day, he would be so excited. Um, but I, I guess selfishly, thought we could do better and, you know, told him that. And um, I'll forget, though, when the, the, buck, uh, the buck stood up and, turned dead away from us and uh Parker could see those hooks coming off off head. you know, he was like, Oh my gosh, Dad, are you serious? And I'm like, Yeah, I think we can do better and everybody else <laughs> thinks we can too and he was just like, Are you kidding me? But Yeah, I know that when when you guys made it down to the truck, Parker was like I can't believe I just passed that deer up and, you know, but all along he kept saying, I want a strip buck. I want a strip buck. And he's like, that was a strip buck that, that had hook yeah. cheaters that, and, you know, he's like, you know, he was, he was definitely questioning it, you know, us. And, um, you know, then the very next day, uh, Breck finds a beautiful buck, um, uh, with a, a fork, uh, on his back fork, kind of a crown point and, um, extra, extra point, beautiful uh, framed buck with no eye guards and um, we went over there and and uh, were kind of set up and I, I slipped around the corner to try and find the buck and and actually ran right smack dab into him and got some great video of him but then again I mean that's a great buck um, beautiful frame buck he posed for me great for the camera but you know it just you know when you think of the strip, you think of mass and you think of gnarly, you think of just, just, you know, the buck that Parker ended up shooting. And, um, so there again, that was a buck that, uh, you, you know, it, it, it all worked out that Parker, uh, got the buck he did. Um, so the fourth morning, um, tell me how the fourth morning broke down there, how it went down. Well, yeah, that, that buck for the buck that, uh, that you're talking about that had the kind of the crown point and was probably a 200 to, I'm going to say 205, just over 200 inch deer, I would guess. Um, we saw him that night right before dark and the plan was to kind of go back in there and try and get a better look at him um, and, and continue to look for other deer. But uh, so we went back to pretty much the same area and right at first light, uh, Brett, was glassing across um, in another direction on the mesa and he says, hey, I got, I got a buck. He looked pretty heavy and I, I got the spotting still for Or no, I looked at him through my 15s and said, yeah, he looks kind of crabby. Let's keep looking. Looks kind of crabby in the front. Let's keep looking. And Brett says, kind of gets, he's walking. <laughs> gets a little bit lighter. He's like, ah, man, he's got a lot of mass. You, you kind of need to look at this deer so I get the spotting scope out and look at him and I'm like oh my gosh he does have tons of mass but he's he's still you know a little 
Travi in, in the front. Um, but we kind of waited until that the sun, you know, got over and was hitting him to where you could really see um, before we could totally appreciate, you know, what, what kind of deer it was. Yeah, he's just one of those deer that, you know, head on, um, you know, later in the day, you were asking me what I thought, and I'm like, you know, head on, he's just a, a hero. I mean, you look at him, and he's 30 inches wide inside, and he's, you know, 35 outside, and he looks unbelievable from the front. When he turns to the side, you're kind of going, what's going on there? Because he's got so much mass, and, you know, it, it, it's it's definitely an interesting buck from the side. And then he turns back and looks at you, or he's going dead away, and you just, you know, you're you're gasping for air. Um, right. You know, and, I think one of the go ahead. Go. I think one of the cool things about that whole situation is you guys were able to make an unbelievable stock over there, and most importantly, from the beginning, you you made it clear that you did not want Parker, you know, jump shooting any deer. You did not want him shooting offhand. You did not want him dropping down to one knee and shooting. You wanted to have him in a prone position. You wanted to have a totally controlled environment. I mean, you were saying that from the beginning and, you know, with the way that everything worked out and getting over there, you know, above them up on the, you know, the rocks above them and, and being able to wait them out in his bed. I mean, that was, that was a, the perfect scenario. It definitely was. And, you know, it, it was also nice that we, you know, we Brett glassed him up pretty much right at first light and then probably, I don't know, an hour after we had been watching him, we kind of rallied the troops and got got people around um, that were close by, you know, to to look at him and watch, um, which was nice because we got everybody got to see him for the most part, and you know, got feedback from everybody as to what they thought. Um, but I think by the time you and and Brett got over there, he was in the tree, I believe, and so Parker. Brett and I took off to get closer, and we got to about 600 yards. And he was look the buck was bedded, but he was kind of quartering to me. And I got the spotting scope out and looked at him, and honestly, I he looked horrible at that angle. I mean, because really all I could see was his front forks, and I just kept looking at Brett, saying, "Man, this does not look good at this angle." But you know. What we had seen earlier, I knew he was a good buck, just a matter of if he was, you know, going to be a shooter or not. Um, so we decided to, the only way to get close enough for a shot was to rim around and get up above him. And that's when, uh, I believe, uh, we were hiking around and the buck got up and was, you know, feeding where you guys could all see him. And uh, Breck said, you know, Dar, I really think you guys ought to shoot this buck. Yeah, I mean, I mean, and people listening are going, you know, how how do you look at a 220 inch deer and not know to shoot it? I, it's just one of those things. I mean, I would not have bet. I did not think in my own heart that the buck was over 200 inches from the look that I got. But like you said earlier, it shows the lack of experience with those deer on the strip. I mean, when we got up to the buck, the buck's body was a horse. I mean, the yeah. head on the thing was huge and yeah. a old buck you know big old very mature buck uh very very worn down teeth and you know old old mature buck even maybe even compared to brex i think it was an older deer and even more mature uh bigger head i think you put the heads the actual skulls skull, next yeah. to each other and and parker's was way bigger and you know it, it, the mass i think we've always said this about a lot of animals, mass hides a lot of things. And, um, you know, I think once you were able to get 312 yards from it and could really look at all the different cheaters and, you know, little kickers and what have you coming off the deer, I mean, it was the epitome of a strip deer. And so, um, you know, tell me about set up with the pack, you know, drive, you know, did you drive fire? How did it all work and how did Parker stay so calm? Well, so yeah, we got up on the rim, uh, me, Brett and Parker got up on the rim above the deer. They were in a little cut just below this rim. So 
we walked out on the rim and, and uh, actually crawled up there. And Brett peeked over and could see the buck down there and told me it was 330 yards and he was bedded facing away from us. So I snuck up there with, with the pack and the gun and, you know, I put the bipod down on the front of the gun and then put the uh, pack, the outdoorsman's pack kind of at the underneath the butt of the gun facing kind of downhill so he had a really solid rest. Um, so basically I got Parker all set up on the buck before I even looked at him. So he was ready. Um, like I said, it was 330 yards. And so once Parker got set up, I got on his right-hand side um, where I was kind of blocking, shading the sun from his, his face while he was looking through the scope. And I set the spotting scope up and looked at the buck, and he was facing away, um, and he looked huge. He looked huge facing away. I mean, heavy, heavy mass. And, you know, he's got, I think, two or three extra points on his left side, an extra eye guard on his right side, and an extra point, another extra hook point on his right side. So I just kept thinking that, you know, adding those up, that's going to make up for those short forks in the front and it's got so much character that we you know it was day four but I, I just felt like you know it's a controlled situation we've got this buck here it's a, it's a, it's a great deer um, you know it's what you come to the strip for I think you know I think we got to shoot him we got most of our guys around you know watching it's just gonna everything was perfect basically so um, at, at that point I decided that Parker should shoot it and uh, so I did have him uh, dry fire, I think, three or four different times to squeeze off on the buck while he was bedded there, um, you know, which I personally, I think that helps keep the, keep him calm. You know, he starts he squeezes off a few times, gets used to it. You know, everything's controlled. And then we waited for probably, I don't know, 30 to 40 minutes before the buck stood up. And he stood up, turned broadside, and Parker just smoked him. I mean, he did awesome. He did him perfect. Yeah, it was uh, just an awesome ending, and uh, it was great to have everyone there, with the exception of Danny Bright, uh, who was in some other country and um, ended up going back to camp. And and but you know, he was the only one that wasn't there, and it was too bad that he wasn't there. Um, but it was great to get back and show him the buck and, you know, we, we were able to take some great photos and, um, it was a, a nice pack out and it was just the whole experience, uh, for me, as, you know, being on the outside, uh, you know, as far as witnessing and watching how everything went down, it just seemed like such a perfect hunt. It did. It did. And it just worked out perfect the way it was supposed to. And, um, you know, we we did have uh, Brian Rimza and Daniel Willett had gone home that afternoon, so they they missed out on it on it. Um, and Dan Bright, like you said, had gone back to another area and then ended up being back at camp at dark. But we had a lot of guys there, um, which just added to it. Um, and one thing I'll say when that we walked up to the buck on the ground, there is no way to describe how big the bodies on those deer are. They're, they're just gigantic. It's like a cow elk when you walk up to them. Um, and I remember, I think it was Daniel Franco, took a measurement of Parker's buck where his neck met his head. And it was 30 inches around his neck from right where, at the you know, smallest part of his neck where it met his head. It was 30 inches around. Yeah, and that's unbelievable. Um you know, and that buck was nosing around with the does and, and, you know, you hear other guys that have hunted 13 B some say they see running and some say they don't see any the whole hunt. And, you know, I think we were blessed there with a good year and, and, uh, phenomenal deer, 30, 30 inches inside, uh, 35 and a half, I believe outside spread. Um, yep. I, I want to say he's got dang near 50 inches of mass, maybe just under 50 inches of mass. And, um, you know, he's got a handful of cheaters and kickers and extra eye guard and, you know, he's just, he's a buck that, that, you know, you, you, you picture the strip and you picture that buck and, um, 
you know, Parker just seemed to be on cloud nine and so proud of, of his accomplishment, and he should be. He should be proud of being 13 years old and harvesting a buck like that. I mean, I think, uh, you know, he may go a long time before he shoots another buck uh, or sees another buck like that. So it was just an awesome experience. Uh, I think I'm sitting on 15 points myself, and so I've got a lot of, uh, you know, I've got to be fortunate in the draws to get my own tag, but it was definitely a, a cool experience. Yeah, and definitely it's, it's but another thing I'll say is that, that Brett and Brett both and, and Daniel Franco and Brian Rimza, who are, have both been up there and you, you know, this was a, a, a year where it just seemed everything was right. Um, they were saying this happens rut wise, weather wise, you know, moon wise every five or six years they get a hunt like this. So it, I would say we were very, very fortunate that, you know, in the year and the way everything worked out, just one of those just special times up there where everything everything uh, came together. And, you know, I look forward to, to going back up there and hunting when you have a tag or Dan Bright or, you know, Paul's probably going to have a tag in the next couple of years also. So, you know, I'm, I can't wait to... Uh, to get back up there and do it again and uh it's just one of those places that you go once and it it just gets in your blood i could definitely see how it uh how it gets you yeah for sure uh, yeah it's it's uh, it's an awesome place um definitely one of the last uh, unbelievable places as far as remoteness and ruggedness and just a vast unbelievable place that you know those deer inhabit and um just a lot of fun. So, buddy, thanks for being on. Uh, how's the real estate? You got uh, got some things in escrow, got some things cooking? Yeah, I got a few things going in escrow. And, uh, you know, typically right now I've been pretty busy, but uh, typically with Thanksgiving and, uh, and the holidays coming, it, it does slow down just a little bit. But that's uh, that's good because usually we're out to, out chasing animals. Yeah, I know uh, we're looking forward to going down and chasing coos deer in Mexico this year in January, and uh, we've got sheep hunts uh, here coming up real quick, and um, it's gonna, it's just an exciting time of year. It's it's the time of year we love, and um, so I want to thank you for being on as always, and uh, congratulate you uh, and your family on a phenomenal year with your boys and two phenomenal deer. I think 2015 for the Colburn boys is going to be pretty hard to beat. Um, it, it may be one of those that uh, may never get beat. You know, harvesting a 220-inch mule deer and a 121-inch coos deer in the same year is uh, pretty phenomenal. But I will say uh, these guys have a – these boys have an unbelievable teacher and mentor and father, and so I would say if anybody could do it again, it would be the Colburn boys. So um, looking forward to future adventures, and uh, thanks for being on the podcast, and uh, uh, good luck with your uh, sheep hunt that you have coming up, and um, keep doing a great job in the real estate, and, and I know your clients are very, very happy with the work that you do for them. Well, thanks for having me on, and uh, as always, uh, I always appreciate it when you're when you're there on the hunt with, with my boys, and you're crucial in uh, being up there on the strip with us. It was uh it was an awesome time for sure. Right on, buddy. Take care and God bless. Okay. Right, you too. Thank you.